Okay, cool. Presenting, recording. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to see, it is presenting, right? Where's my... Can you guys see my screen? Again, I'm getting that sort of error where I can't actually see the other machine's presentation just yet. You can see, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so we're gonna be taking a look at this really cool character that a friend of mine, Chris, put together a, a few years ago for us. Um, and what I want to do is uh, we're sort of just going to take this one as a class exercise that will eventually then come into fruition as your final assignment. Okay, so whatever we get done today, I'm going to be showing you how to animate one of the larger sections of this um, piece. And uh, then you'll go and finish it and refine it, and then you'll be nice and finished with it. Okay, so taking a look at our layers. All right, now I still can't see... So if you guys can just like give me a shout if and when it like the stream freezes. Okay. I'm actually just going to end this call on this machine and rejoin here. Okay. Sorry guys, this is getting a bit frustrating here. Uh, Okay, well, as long as you guys can see it, you someone with, with a mic, just give me a shout if, uh, if, it, gets, if it gets frozen. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, set you guys the task of moving your anchor points into the correct positions. All right, so this is something we've been working on for the past two terms. Ah, there we go. Now I can see it. Um, you'll see that I've color-coded everything as well in our layers. Okay, so just grab the, uh, the pan behind tool. We're going to set this one up for complete animation. And I'm just going to start soloing my assets and moving my anchor points with my pan behind tool. Okay, so you guys can do that for me. If you finish your pan behind tool, uh, if you finish sort of moving all your anchor points into the correct positions, you can then also start uh, parenting, right? So parent it as you see fit, as you think it would be. And then once everyone is ready, I will read all of them out for you guys. Uh, can you guys hear the sort of like talking in the background? Is that like going to be a distracting feature? No. Okay, cool. Okay, brilliant. I was worried. I'm in a house full of students now and they're all streaming their courses. So obviously worried that I'm going to get some cross interference. Okay, so that's, that's what I've done. Uh, the anchor point for the eyes, we can leave those where they are. All right, just to give you an idea. The anchor point for the torso, that's layer 12. I'm going to move the anchor point for the torso right here in between the belt. All right, so essentially where the torso would join with the leg layer. Okay. See now, this is what I'm worrying about is just the bandwidth now. Okay, let's take a look, see. Okay, uh, so the anchor point I'm going to put for the for layer 12, I'm going to put uh, sort of like on the belt. And then for layer 13, that's the feet, I'm literally just going to drag it down and put the anchor point where the asset stops. Um, so where the, where the image stops, where it touches the ground. Okay, and the rest are... Uh, also, then self explanatory. Okay. 
Uh, there we go. Getting the actual stream to work. Okay. While we're doing this, how's everybody feeling about their work so far? Um, just in terms of like stress load, is there anyone really struggling, anyone left behind? I know that this class is fairly solid, so I'm not too worried, but maybe that's a mistake of my part. Errors make eyes hurt. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? All good otherwise. Good. I'm glad to hear. Um, you guys will have seen that I posted that link on Classroom. Just one subject. Which one's that? Which one's the hard one? I'm assuming it's game or 3D. Let me see if I'm right. Um, yeah, so you guys will have seen that I put up that link on Classroom. I also put it up on the Discord for those of you who have um, joined that. And that is um, the link that will take you to the booking form for me. So if I just quickly show that. Um, so I've set up this entire system, very easy to use uh, academic practice. Yeah, man, I remember those days. Um, okay, so very easy for you guys to set up appointments with me here. Uh, literally, you get to pick a time that works for you, um, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so as long as we remember that, then we are good. All righty. Okay, so as I said, once you start getting your, um, your anchor points into position, once you're done doing that, I want you to start with your parenting. Okay, and um, what you can do with the parenting is obviously try and do it yourself. I want to get you guys into the process of, um, you know, thinking about the parenting yourselves, but I will then once I am done with my parenting, um, read out loud, which layers are parented to what, and you'll also be able to see on the stream when it eventually updates the layer number that I've parented to. Okay. So you can essentially just click that little drop down and then click on whatever number you'll see on mine. Okay. Uh, no, no, four arm, two, upper arm. I'm going to pair my torso to my legs, layer twelve to thirteen. Okay, cool. So you guys will then see my little drop downs over here. Okay, so <clears throat> is anyone still busy with anchor points before I move on? Is there anyone that I'm leaving behind at the moment? You're still busy, that's cool. Do not stress. For those of you who are done, just take a look at my parenting. Right, the only layer that doesn't have a parent is layer 13, our legs. Okay. And then, yeah, at this point, it's just our animation. Now we can start moving into the actual animation.
All right, Al, you just let me know when you're done, and um, we'll take it from there. So just to fill the silence a little bit, um, as I've said, this is our idle animation exercise, all right? And we have, in the past, we've now taken a look at a couple of versions of um, inverse kinematics as well as forward kinematics, all right? Does anyone want to take, um, take the opportunity or take the, the, the risk, the leap of faith um, to tell me what the difference between IK and FK is? Inverse kinematics and forward kinematics? Literally not a single person this week has answered, so I'm very keen to see if anyone is brave enough to. No? Okay, okay, okay. See how it is. <laughs> uh, remember that with inverse kinematics, that is the, um, that's the character, for example, that uh, the cucumber that I gave you for the walk cycle. Right, um, inverse kinematics meaning that our joints, our assets, are being controlled by a single controller, right? Um, sort of like moving it around rather than consistently animating rotation. Okay. Um, forward kinematics. That is when we work with rotation. All right. So we took a look at how we can go about generating bones using Duic. We then an uh, sort of animate the rotation of those bones. Uh, as well as the position of those bones, and that is another form of forward kinematics. Okay, finally, this is kind of the last version, and it's very similar to what we did with the O-snap exercises at the start of the term. Uh, in um, forward kinematics, just in terms of animating the rotation of our joints. Okay, so, uh, Alistair, you're all good. Is anyone still busy with parenting? Do I need to read them out? You are Good, great. Let me get my nicotine going before we start. Okay, so we're only going to be taking a look at the orange layers today. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select layers 1 down to 13. I'm going to make them shy and I will lock them as well. Okay, and that way we're only looking at this. Now, the file that I've given you guys, if I just quickly go back... Um, because I remember now that there is a small error. Your layer one will probably be an adjustment layer, all right? Um, and I want you guys to delete that layer. When you do, what will most likely happen is that you'll get a yellow bar at the bottom of your viewing screen that says some sort of expression error. It's like an orange bar that rocks up, okay? If you select all of the layers after you've deleted that uh, adjustment layer and you hit R for rotation, you'll see that some of your values are red. So for example, I think the back upper arm is one of them, the back hand, I'm just going to apply it here. Okay, so remember I told you guys that when a value is red, it means that it is being controlled or has been linked to something else. Okay, so the reason why you're getting that error is because the link no longer exists. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is to get rid of these red values, holding down Option on a Mac or Alt on a Windows, we are going to click on our little stopwatch, all right, the one that we would normally click on to create a keyframe, and that is going to remove any expressions on our uh, layers, and then we won't have that error anymore. Okay, so uh, expressions, I don't know if I've sort of spoken about expressions before in the past, but expressions are little pieces of code that we can um, sort of like use inside of After Effects in order to make our lives a lot easier, right? So if I wanted a continuous walk cycle, for example, I could create um, expressions on the layers that are moving and then just tell them to keep cycling forever. And then I'll have a constant walk for as long as my timeline is. Okay, so expressions is something that you'll start learning in second and third year. I believe that the first term of second year is the elective, is uh, motion design techniques, and that's where you'll start taking a look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, start taking a look at how to use expressions. 
Okay, uh, let me stop here and present again. Okay, there we go. Alrighty, so I am going to do exactly what we've been doing so far um, for the rest of, or from the rest of the term. We're going to be focusing on the backhand movements over here, and I'll also show you how to adjust the eyes so that we can get a cool little blink. Okay, so sitting on top of second number one, so that all of our keyframes will uh, coincide with a number, I am going to select my back upper arm and my back forearm. Okay, now these are sort of like the, even though the main motion, ah, haha, I have forgotten to show you something, sorry. Uh, inside our composition, sorry, my head's everywhere today. Uh, we are inside the idle class exercise composition here. Moving over to the idlers composition, the second tab above our timeline, you'll see that we have an entirely pre-animated piece. All right, so I've given this to you in the hopes that you're not going to cheat and just copy and paste those keyframes but to provide reference that you can then go and take a look at how it was dealt with inside of the graph editor, for example. All right. The exercise today is focusing on subtlety. So that's what we're going to try and emulate. All right. So if we take a look at our reference footage here, uh, our character chills for quite a bit. Then his arms pull in. We go into the bell ring. And then we come back to rest again. Okay. So... We are going to then animate that movement on this arm, and then you'll be in charge of animating the rest of it as homework. All righty. Are we all good to go? Is there anyone I should wait for? All good. I'm assuming you guys are usually on point. So, okay. So starting with our back upper arm, I'm going to hit rotation, and I'll create my very first keyframe, and I'll do the same for layer 21. So 21, 22. My rotation keyframes now read zero degrees. Okay. Moving over to second number two to create our second keyframes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my back arm, the upper arm backwards slightly, right? So that means that I have now adjusted my second keyframe. I know there's the stream catching up. Second keyframe is positive two degrees. Okay, then I am going to animate the forearm to also pull inwards, and I'm going to make that negative 2.5 degrees. Okay, negative 2.5 on my second keyframe on layer 21. Moving over to second number three, what I'm going to do is, this is where our movement is going to come forward. Okay, so I'm going to bring our back arm forward ever so slightly. And I'll take this to negative one. All right, so my third keyframe for layer 22, negative one degrees. Oh, can't keep it lit and focus. Okay, then we're going to bring our arm forward. All right, and I don't want it to be too intense, but about five degrees would probably be a good one. Okay. And then moving over to second number four, I'm going to bring that upper arm backwards down to positive two degrees and I can adjust my upper arm to negative 1.5. Okay, so now we've got like a little bell movement going on. So I can now actually just cheat. This is probably going to be about nine seconds, nine frames included. So if I copy keyframes three and four for layer 21, and I paste them above second five and six, you'll see that I have now duplicated that ringing motion back and forth. Okay, so we can do that one more time, just pasting over, uh, actually no, so we're gonna have him ring twice. So, above second number seven, I'm going to copy and paste my second keyframe. And then above second eight, I will copy and paste my first keyframe. Okay, now the reason why is because that's going to allow us to bring that arm back to rest. All right, so we've got a bit of a, like a dingling motion going on. And then our arm comes back to rest. And it actually moves beyond rest, right? Remember that we have that overlapping action. So it moves beyond rest and then comes back to a full stop. 
Okay, so if I can read those values out again for you guys, because I see the stream is being a bit of a bitch. Rotation on 21, the very first keyframe, zero degrees. Layer 22, zero degrees. 21, the second keyframe reads negative, uh, negative 2.5 degrees on layer 21, positive 2 degrees on layer 22. Third keyframe reads positive 5 for layer 21, negative 1 for layer 22. Then we have our fourth keyframes, positive 2 for layer 21 and negative 1.5 for uh, layer 22. Okay, and this is where I'm going to do the same thing that I've done. So currently on layer 21, it reads five, positive 5 degrees. I'm going to select for layer 22 my third and fourth keyframe, copy and paste it down over seconds 5 and 6. Copy my second keyframe to be my second last keyframe. And then finally, copy and paste my first keyframe to be my last keyframe. Okay, so if you go through this, you'll have like a little motion going on in the arms, which is quite nice. Okay, cool. So just reading from the fourth keyframe of each, just so that you guys can get that value there. Layer 21, rotation positive 2.0. 22, uh, layer 22 is um, negative 1.5. All right, moving along. Fifth keyframe is positive 5 for layer 21, negative 1 for layer 22. Sixth keyframe, positive 2 for layer 21, negative 1.5 for 22. Layer 21 for our seventh keyframe, negative 2.5 for layer 21. 22 is 2.0, positive 2. And then finally coming back to 0 on our eighth keyframe. Okay. Let's try and get this updated a little bit. There we go. Okay, cool. So now it's time to start blocking out or essentially just um, planning out the movements of our hands, fingers, and the bell. Okay, so moving on to layer 20, that's our back hand. I'm gonna hit R for rotation and create my very first keyframe. Okay. And then moving out to as my arm draws back, what I will do here is I can either animate my hand going outwards or inwards. All right. So we can either have the illusion of as my arm pulls back, I'm getting ready to ring it like that. Or as my arm pulls back, I start lifting it and getting ready for that ring. Okay. So for the sake of interest, um, let us have that rotate forward a little bit. Okay. So my second keyframe is negative 10. Right, moving forward, my third keyframe for layer 20, I'm going to bring down to positive 10. And we're just going to use those two values. All right, so negative 10, positive 10, negative 10, copy and paste, keyframes three and four over keyframe five and six. Copy and paste my second last keyframe over second seven, and then copy and paste my first keyframe over second eight. So I just want to make sure that I've got that movement going on. Ah, okay, I see that I've got a little bit of a mix-up going on here. Um, so my layer 20, the sixth keyframe currently reads negative 10. I see that I didn't adjust that for my seventh keyframe. So I will make that positive 10. So that is keyframe seven now reads positive 10. And then finally it comes back to zero. Okay. All right. So we're starting to get the hang of this. So starting to bring it all together. Okay. Um, so I parented my bell to layer 19, which is my back index. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my back index and my back thumb layers. Okay. So that's layer 16 and 19. And I'll create a rotation keyframe at zero degrees for each. All right, and then I'm going to use these fingers to supplement the motion of the bell. So I'm going to work with values of 5 for layers 16 and 19. We worked with values of 10 for the bell itself. All right, so as my bell moves outwards and then inwards, so I'll bring that to positive 5. So that's my third set of keyframes is positive 5. I'll then copy and paste my second and third keyframe here. No, oh, no, wait, I want to see what do I, what do I need to do here? So that's in, that one's going out. 
So I can copy and paste my second keyframe for each of those. Moving down the line, copy and paste my third keyframe is here. And then I'll just copy and paste these. So you guys will see that you can't copy and paste multiple keys over multiple layers. It duplicates the layer, unfortunately. Um, so we have to do that layer by layer. Okay, so I'm going to read out the values for layers 16 and 19. So 0 and 0. Second keyframe reads negative 5, negative 5. Third keyframe reads positive 5, positive 5. Fourth keyframe reads negative 5, negative 5. Fifth keyframe, positive 5, positive 5. Sixth keyframe, negative 5, negative 5. Seventh keyframe, positive 5, positive 5, coming to rest at 0. Okay, and I might go back to my seventh keyframe for layers um, 16 and 19, and I'm actually just going to make that a positive 2.5. Not positive 25, positive 2.5. Uh, and that is just going to decrease the, the movement so that we sort of have a smaller movement coming to rest. Okay. Are we all good so far? Am I leaving anybody behind? I know that I'm moving a little bit quickly. All good. Cool. I am glad to hear it. Okay. So now we've got those fingers going, which is selling the idea of that bell. And then we are going to grab layer 17. Okay, layer 17 is the bell itself. And again, I'm going to use the rotation of my layer just to sell the idea ever so slightly that this is sort of not being held super tight in the hand, for example. Uh, so I'm going to use values of three. So I start off my very first keyframe for layer 17 is zero degrees. And my second keyframe is negative three. Okay. Then I'm going to still work in uh, sort of values of three. So first keyframe reads zero. Second keyframe reads negative three. Third keyframe reads positive three. And we're literally just going to copy and paste that to continue my cycle going on there. Okay. Uh, so my last keyframe there was positive three. So my next one needs to be negative three. can make that one maybe positive 1.5. So my seventh keyframe for layer 17 is going to read 1.5. And my eighth keyframe will come back to zero. So I can simply copy and paste my first keyframe there. OK, so now we're starting to get some decent movement going on. So just to read those values out again, Layer 17, value, first keyframe reads 0 degrees. Second, negative 3. Third, positive 3. Fourth, negative 3. Fifth, positive 3. Sixth, negative 3. Seventh, positive 1.5. And then eighth is 0. Okay, I'm going to stop present. So there we go. You want to catch up for me? Okay, cool. Okay. Cool. So now I'm just going to collapse some of these layers because we can sort of, we've already got them all blocked out on layer 17. And I want to work on layer 18 now. This is the bell thingy, right? It's actually called a clanger. I just didn't know it at the time. Okay. So whenever or wherever our bell moves, whatever the direction that our bell moves in, our clanger is going to move in the opposite direction. Okay. So if my clanger or my bell rather is moving in a forward direction then my clanger needs to move in the opposite direction okay uh and we kind of want to get the idea of this clanger getting a little bit stronger so my second keyframe for layer 18 is going to be positive 20. then i'm going to make my third keyframe negative 30. my fourth keyframe i'll make 40. Fifth keyframe, I'll make negative 30. Sixth keyframe, I'll make 20. Seventh keyframe, I'll make negative 15. Or let's make it negative 10. 
keyframe eight. Now remember that we've got our overlapping action, right? So um, our keys are going to extend now beyond the actual bell. I'm not happy with where my seventh keyframe is for my bell thingy. That's currently at zero degrees. I obviously didn't hit the one for 10. Okay, so uh, seventh keyframe is 10 degrees. Eighth keyframe is going to be negative seven. Ninth keyframe for that bell thingy is going to be positive five. Tenth keyframe can be negative three. And eleventh keyframe can come back to rest at zero degrees. Okay, so if I play that back, our bell looks fairly boring at the moment, but at least our sort of clangor moves back and forth and comes to a rest at the end. Okay, cool. So that's the clangor piece done. Now we're just going to do those back fingers. So that's the pinky and the middle finger at the back here. And then we can start with the second and then finally the third round of animation for today. Okay, so we're going to be working with layers 14 and 15. I'll create rotation keyframes on layer one. Sorry, keyframe one. And that will then, let me bring this up so that I can actually use my shortcut. There we go. Okay, so these fingers are back pinky and uh, back middle. They're going to rotate at the same time in the same direction. So I can work with both of them. Um, as my hand moves out, I'm going to bring those fingers out slightly. So I'll make that negative 10 for each of those. Okay, let's make sure that they align. Moving on, I will then set this to positive 10, and I will then just keep using those values. So I can copy and paste so that keyframes 4 and 5 read negative 10 and then positive 10 for both. Layer 6, um, here I want my fingers to go up, so on layer 6, I, or keyframe 6 rather, I will make that negative 10. Seventh keyframe I'll make, let's do positive 5. And then eighth keyframe coming back to rest at zero degrees. Okay. So now we've got the motion down. Right? So we've got that main movement going on. Get the stream back up to date again. Uh, okay. Cool. So we have now done that. And what I want to do now is we're going to apply some easing, right? So we remember how to do that. I'm going to hit Command A. I'll hit U to bring up all of the keyframes that are currently in the timeline and making sure to select all of them and apply easing. Yeah, so we select all of them and then hit F9. Alrighty. Um, okay, so now that we've applied some easing, this is going to be a little bit nicer looking already. Um, we're not going to take a look at the graph editor today, and that's only because the graph editor is a nice little simple piece, and I want you guys to try and do that on your own. Okay, so we're used to the idea of using the graph editor to create some very like strong, very fast motion. This is obviously going to be timed according to the actual motion needed. Okay, who can tell me, apart from the graph editor, what would we do next in order to make this animation start to look a little bit more visually interesting? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? No? John? Timing? There we go. Cool. Move the keyframes. Exactly. All right, so we want to bring these keyframes closer together. Um, and there's two ways that I could do this. We remember that if I hold down Option or Alt and I click and drag my furthest keyframe in, I then shorten the amount of keyframes that we have. But it keeps the, the distance between 
or like let's say the ratio of frames between the, the keys the same. So I don't necessarily want to do that. All right. And that's simply because we know that certain actions in this animation are going to need um, more keyframes or fewer keyframes, depending on what it is that we're looking at. Okay, so the best way to go about doing this, and I'm getting so full of the stream, I'm sorry, dudes. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I will leave my first set of keyframes as they are, and I'll select the rest of them. And I'm going to start moving these to the left so that we change their timing. Now, this anticipation movement, I'm going to give 10 frames. Uh, I'm actually going to give it 12 frames. So holding down uh, Command and Shift or Alt, or is it Control Shift? I don't know if it's Alt or Control Shift on a Windows. But then using Page Up and Page Down, it'll jump me out by a value of 10. And then I just counted two frames to give that 12 frames to take place. Okay. Then we have our bell movement. Okay, I'm gonna give that 10 frames. It's going to get faster, but we're selling the idea that um, this is going to sort of just change there slightly. So let's do that. The next action, I'm going to give eight frames, and that's what I'll do for the rest of the bell rings. So eight, eight. Eight. Then I'll start slowing things down. So uh, moving towards my second last and last keyframes, obviously disregarding the bell thingy. I'm going to give that 10 frames. Then I'll give it 12 frames so that our arm comes to rest. And then we want our bell clanger to slowly come to rest, right? So at first I'll give it 10 frames. Then I'll give it 12 frames, and then I'll give it 15 frames to finish. Okay, and I'm completely making these frame values up, right? There's no set rule. Um, I can go back and change these as, uh, as many times as I want. Um, but for now, kind of just going on a guess. That's how many spaces I would leave for that. Okay, um, one last step to make this completely visually interesting to really incorporate the important um, principles that we've been learning so far. What would our final step be? Ivana? John, do you guys want to take a guess? John? No? Okay, so we want to introduce some overlapping action, right? Because at the moment, if you hit spacebar, everything's moving at the same speed. It's really boring, right? And it's not realistic at all. So what I'll start doing is we know that the back upper arm, that's layer 22, right? That's kind of where our motion sort of starts stemming from. There's a little bit of a ruck in the shoulder as we bring that forearm out, okay? So I'm going to select all of the keyframes except for layer, 20, uh, for layer 22. And I'm going to move these down the timeline by two frames. Okay, uh, then holding down shift, I can deselect the keys on layer 21 and I'll move everything else down by two frames. Okay, and we're essentially gonna be doing this for everything. So continuously every set we can move those down by two frames. Our bell clanger, that definitely, or our bell thingy rather, that definitely needs to be a few frames uh, behind the bell itself. Okay, and then we start taking a look at our layers for layers 14, 15, and 16. Okay, so the bell itself, um, actually needs to sit where it currently is. So this is the bell over here. I'll lock that layer so that I don't accidentally mess with it. And I'll move my bell clanger even further down the timeline. Okay, it's a little bit much. So let me move it back by about one frame. Okay. Taking a look at the back thumb and back middle fingers. All right, those are going to be maybe two frames down the line from where our bell is. Um, our pinky will be the same. 
And then just to take a look at our final two layers. So we're going to have our pinky and back finger moving um, essentially the slowest, right? Or at the sort of end at the, at the step. So if you take a look at your hand and you close all your fingers, right? Closing your middle finger does affect, or sorry, closing your ring finger affects your middle finger and your pinky a little bit, right? But if you close the pinky, you can't help but close your ring finger. Okay, which means that our back pinky is going to be the driving force for those finger movements. And I'm just going to then shift my back middle finger down the line a little bit, just so we get a little bit of overlapping. And you can see that I need to adjust that slightly. Okay, so I definitely need to rework my timing. Playing this back, it really doesn't look that great. Uh, so I'm just going to undo all of that. In the meantime, I want you guys to go ahead and start your retiming. Okay, if we get this done correctly, then we will be able to continue. Uh, you'll be able to use that essentially for your actual animation piece. Okay, there and there. Let's see how that's looking. Yeah. Uh, so we can select all of these. Let's grab that. Shift it down a little bit. Uh, back index can stay there. The back hand, maybe I can bring back slightly. There and there. Let's see how that's looking. Okay, that's looking a lot better. Okay. So again, if I wanted this action to take place a little bit faster than it currently is, I can drag it down and we can make that about three seconds long even. Very fast. So let's maybe drag that back up to four seconds. See how that looks. Okay. So you can see here, depending on the timing involved, these actions are currently now very large. Right? So what I could do here is I could then go back and just start adjusting the, uh, the size or the, the difference between rotation values. Okay, just to make that a little bit more subtle. So that's probably going to be most of the feedback we do for this exercise is to just reduce your values a little bit. So start off almost with try and think of subtle movement in terms of um, too small a movement, which we're used to at this point working with very large value differences, blocking out our keyframes. Right? This one we want to try and be as subtle as possible while still having that action involved. Right. Okay, the last thing that I want to show you with this file before we call it an end for the day, uh, you guys are getting through this a lot quicker than most. Uh, I just want to show you the eyes. Okay, so let me close that quickly. Um, so the eyes, if we hit scale, we're not going to work with the rotation for the eyes. Uh, if we create a keyframe for scale, you'll see that I've already unlinked those values for you. All right, so playing with the second set of values, I can increase the size of my eyes by increasing the value of that scale. And if I were to bring that down to about 50, for example, let's maybe make it 30. I get the illusion of a blink. Okay, so our very first keyframe will typically be 100, 100. I'll move down by three frames and make it 125. And then two frames further along, I can simply bring that value back, back to 100. All right. So if you've done that, a blink only needs three keyframes. All right. So there we've got an individual blink going on. And because my very first keyframe is exactly the same as the last keyframe, if I copy and paste to sort of duplicate that, I get a double blink going on. Okay. Now, typically, when we are sort of like how we go about timing our um, blinks is that typically we start a blink at the beginning of a motion, all right? Or as we've seen with the lip sync, we can sometimes start blinking as we begin a word, okay? Now, the cool thing about your brain and about your eyes is that you're technically blind every day for, I think it's close to like 20 minutes. 
And that's because when you move your eyes from left to right, you don't interpret the information in between, right? So left, right, that information your brain kind of just ignores so that it doesn't get over fried. Um, so we keep that in mind. If we are going to turn our head in any direction, we typically then blink during that motion as well. Okay, so we kind of just keep that in mind. All righty. We typically don't need to add easing to our blinks, right? Unless we were doing something like a wink, maybe. Um, but that's not something that we're going to worry about for this exercise. Okay. Are we all good? Do we, are we all sort of comfortable with what I've shown you now? Can I show you the homework and all of that? Yeah. Dope. Okay, cool. So let us quickly take a look at... Where is my... The show file here. All right. So, just in terms of the walk cycle, to catch you guys up with the idea of that, um, I have provided on Classroom the most recent update version of the Cool Cucumber Rig. Right. So, that's the one where I added um, null objects to the shoulders and the hips so that we can roll them across the body. Okay. So, you are welcome to use that. That is well within the scope of the lesson. But if you want to try for some extra credit and you want to sort of really have some free reigns over your character, I have also provided these bespoke characters over here. So I've got a fat guy, I've got a skinny guy, I've given you the verbal instructions over here about what you can do. And essentially what I'm saying is that you can adjust and change these as much as you want. If you're going to use this, please at least change the colors. All right. Uh, and you can change the scale, the size, anything like this. Make him look your own. Okay. I've tried to make this, uh, the layering sort of titles as easy to use as possible, right? So what I have done here, let me just lock this background, is I've given you two versions of the, of the limbs, right? The first version, which is attached to the limbs, are solid layers, okay? So if you wanted to do forward kinematics with the bone method, you would use these layers, and I have labeled them as FK, forward kinematics, okay? The layers that we have here to the left, these have all been labeled IK. So these are, um, if you were going to generate a rig for your arms and legs, then you would use these inverse kinematic layers. However, as we have now just seen with our idle character, we can still do forward kinematics with these assets. Okay. So the method that you use for your walk cycle is completely up to you. The way that your character looks is completely up to you. And any extra effort that goes into these uh, will obviously be rewarded. Okay. Cool. Then let's take a look at our roadmap so that we're all on the same page. Okay. So we are currently in week seven. I have now introduced the idle animation to you. Okay. Our force and weight is looking really good. I'm really happy with what is being um, submitted so far. But what we need to start doing now for those animations is to think about the timing involved. right? So just as we've just done shifting our keyframes closer together, further apart, overlapping things slightly, that's really where the refinement comes in. Okay, The lip sync, we are slightly behind, obviously, because I got the files to you a little bit late. So by next week, I want you guys to have your blocked out uh, lip sync animation. It doesn't need to have easing applied, but if you would like to do that, obviously, you're welcome to. But at least block out all the mouth shapes, all the blinks, all the eyebrow movements if necessary, so we can get a good idea of that. Okay. Uh, the idle animation, you can going to complete the exercise, you'll submit that, I'll give you your feedback, uh, and then you will sort of finish that animation as your assignment. Okay, so what I want you guys to keep in mind, I did show you, we only worked with one uh, sort of layers, we only worked with the uh, back arm. I want you to finish the entire piece, okay? And that's why you can refer back to the idlers here, scrubbing through, you can see them, the sort of minor movements involved in everything. Okay, so don't make the mistake of only refining that back arm, I want the entire piece done, please. Okay, back to the roadmap. Uh, next week, week eight, no compulsory classes, right? So no attendance or any sort of issues or stress like that. Um, what we can do next week is I'm sure you guys have seen, posted a link onto Classroom where you can start booking your compulsory contact sessions. All right, I'm going to sort of then give you as much feedback as I can in those sessions. And then by week nine, you should be ready to submit. 
Okay. Any questions regarding that? Make sure that I'm not leaving out any important information here. No. Cool. Okay. Are there any questions? Any uh, questions with regards to what I've shown you today? Or with regards to homework? No? Cool. All right. Then I'll see you guys uh, in your contact sessions whenever those are. All right. Um, when you submit your renders for homework, please make sure that you submit everything. Okay. Because I need to be able to give you uh, feedback on all of your rendered videos. Okay. So for our week eight homework, you'll see that I've given you all four of these tasks. Uh, oh, wait. I see that I'm not, I'm not presenting. Sorry. Um, let me just go back here quickly. There we go. Okay. So you'll see for your homework here for, for next week, four assignments, please. Uh, refer back to the roadmap if you get lost. I've given that to you as well. Uh, and I need all four of these renders so that I can give you complete feedback in week eight. Okay. So please make sure for that. But apart from that, we are done. We are good to go. I hope that you have a great day further. Stay safe. Don't stress too much. And uh, yeah, we'll pick it up in your contact sessions next week. Cool. Cheers, John. Stay well, dude. Uh, Alistair, stay well. Jacques, cheers, man. Good luck with the rest of it. Away, Yola. Stay well, dude. Ivana, stay well. I'll see you guys.